Funding for lawmakers comes from... The University of West Georgia in Carrollton, ensuring a better life for Georgians in the 21st century. More than 100 programs of study prepare students for successful careers in the critical professions of education and nursing, as well as business and the liberal arts. The Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of Georgia's business community, over 4,000 members strong, working with lawmakers for over 90 years to make sure that our state remains a place where companies thrive. And by supporters of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Coming up on Lawmakers, highlights of last week's budget briefings, an in-depth interview with the House and Senate Appropriations Chairs about the state budget, and Senate leadership announces plans that could impact the funding and control of transportation projects. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelsky. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, the proposal that would make Georgia a zero-based budgeting system passes out of committee. And the one-year anniversary of the Dixie Crystal Plan explosion leads to talk of trauma funding in the House. But first, our top story tonight, the nation's economic woes reached Georgia in last week's budget briefings. Georgia's budget deficit is $2.2 billion, not bad in comparison to states like California, which is expected to reach a $40 billion deficit over the next few months. Regardless, Governor Sonny Perdue does not want to wait for federal bailout money. He says the tough cuts and decisions must be made. That was the theme of last week's Joint House Appropriations Committee budget briefings. Cuts. Every single day, the requirements are changing. Cuts. The model is broken. And more cuts. The budget theme across the country rings true in Georgia. When we talk today about cuts, we're really getting down to the bone. State agency heads have already gone through one round of cuts, ranging from 6 to 10 percent. And now the governor is asking for more from both agency heads and property owners. It became virtually physically impossible to, uh, uh, that I saw to fund the $428 million dollars uh, in the homeowner tax relief grant. State fiscal economist Kenneth Hegany explains how Georgia could get out of this $2.2 billion hole. First, uh, the governor mentioned the fiscal stimulus plan that the new president has uh, talked about but not really detailed to our knowledge. Second thing is uh, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury have taken unprecedented and massive steps to unfreeze uh, financial markets, injecting tremendous amounts of liquidity to stimulate borrowing and get the economy moving again. And then the final countervailing force is the drop in commodity prices. Agency heads have different approaches on how to deliver the necessary cuts. Department of Human Resources Commissioner B.J. Walker talks about additional furloughs for administrative staff. We've also needed to eliminate 45 real positions. Uh, uh, we've also been able to do another furlough. We are all at DHR in the admin program only, taking a second day a month of furlough from now until the end of this fiscal year. And University System of Georgia Chancellor Errol Davis went another direction, suggesting no furloughs and criticizing the reasoning behind suggested cuts to higher education. We are not, uh, from our perspective, a cost to the state and its citizens. Uh, we are instead an investment. A cost is having uneducated citizens. A cost is having unhealthy citizens. Uh, they cost the state. Uh, we do not. So the budget will now be priority number one in the House and the governor's proposed tax increases could find opposition amongst those who vowed to their constituents never to raise taxes. We will bring you more from last week's budget briefings later in our program. Senate leadership today announced plans that could have an impact on the control of and funding for transportation projects. Lawmakers Minu Hosseini is live at the Capitol with that story. Minu. That's right, and Wandi Senator Chip Rogers explained the plan to use the rainy day fund along with the 1% sales tax to create transportation projects within the state. Clearly, this is an issue that extends beyond just moving people from point A to point B. The reality is, is that transportation uh, is both a short-term 
and a long-term economic development issue. In the short term, we need people back to work. We need the construction industry back up and rolling again. We need people building transportation projects. In the long term, this is very simple. We do not need to lose another job in Georgia because of transportation. The two-part plan includes a transfer of control of the highways from the Department of Transportation to the General Assembly in a regional approach towards highway construction. The second part would allow counties to impose a 1% sales tax to raise revenue for transportation projects, a proposal that failed last year. Last session, we passed out of the Senate, Senate Resolution 845. The House then passed that same resolution back to us with some slight changes. So both of us are on record for, for passing transportation legislation as it pertains to, to an approach for funding. Um, over this past uh, summer and into the fall, uh, our leaders on our side worked with the House of Representatives and came to agree an agreement on, on a number of issues. And so I think as far as the progress of the legislation, uh, we're much further along today than we were last year. But at the annual Eggs and Issues breakfast earlier this month, House Speaker Glenn Richardson openly rejected the idea of a regional approach to transportation. See, simply drawing a circle around Atlanta and letting Atlanta tax themselves and fix transportation in Atlanta, I don't believe will help transportation in Atlanta. I think it'll make it worse. Mullis introduced this legislation today saying that if the 10 counties in and around Metro Atlanta approve the 1% sales tax, approximately $850 million in revenue could be brought in each year for transportation. Reporting live, I'm Minu Hosseini for Lawmakers. Thanks for that report, Minu. Well, earlier today, David and I sat down with legislators who are heading the budget process. I began by asking House Appropriations Chairman Ben Harbin whether the governor's proposal to eliminate property tax grants is a foregone conclusion. No. I mean, the, the, I think the General Assembly, another House, we have a little different opinion than the governor. We think those are critical. We've made a commitment. Uh, maybe they haven't you know, benefited the property owners as much as they should have. It hasn't achieved the goal we were after. But we still think it's important to meet that commitment, and we are going to do our best to try to fund those grants, in this, in, at least in the amended 09 budget. Is this looked at as a tax increase? People term it in different ways, but <coughs> how, are, how are legislators looking at this? I think legislators do consider it um, certainly a sensitive tax issue because the tax notices went out with the with the reduction on the front of the tax notice and then for the notices to have to be resent with an additional uh, payment that's required, whether it's legal or not is, is not uh, nearly as important as in a year when everyone really believes they should get tax breaks and not tax increases. I think it's particularly important and our, I believe that our leadership and the majority of the Senate is also in favor of trying to find the funds to, to fund it. Another issue that could bring a lot of money but could also bring a lot of controversy is the hospital fees and it looks like most hospitals wouldn't be exempt, exempt from this. What is the latest with that and how much steam could get that get going through the House and Senate? Well, it, it is a way to, to plug some holes in, in the O10 budget. I, it, it, um, of course, the federal government put us in this position when CMS uh, invalidated the, the uh, tax we put on CMOs, or care management organizations now. so. We're forced to do it, either tax everyone or tax no one. And lower the percentage, the governor's proposal is to lower the percentage on, on both and then to add a hospital tax. The hospital tax is not very popular over in the Senate, um, mainly because many, and many of the hospitals who are struggling uh, would be called on to contribute to this tax. And I, you know, it, it may well endanger some of the, some of the hospital's existence. So, we're certainly looking at other other avenues to try to come up with those dollars as well. It's about a $200 million hole. Though. Both the House and the Senate today <coughs> looking at the uh, anniversary of the, of the Big Dixie Crystal explosion and kind of bringing attention to trauma care here <coughs> in the state. What are we looking at in terms of uh, funding for, for that area of health care? You know, there are a lot of proposals. Uh, Representative Stevens has the dollar tobacco tax. Uh, Speaker Richardson had the $10 tag fee. All of those are being looked at. Um, that was, you know, I'm not from Savannah, but the Augusta area where I'm from, the burn center that treated all of those is in our area. And, the, and that burn center, the steel burn center, does a tremendous job. And it was nice to see them recognized today for the work they do. But, and I think it did highlight, we need a trauma system. Uh, now the debate is how do we fund it if we're going to do it? Because it takes about 80 million to 90 million a year. Uh, Speaker Pro Tem Burkhalter and I last year put a bill in 
to, there's a quarter property tax, quarter mill property tax that, that comes to the state and it's around 80 million. And we put a bill in that instead of it coming to the general fund to dedicate that to, uh, to trauma as well. So there are a lot of options. I don't think anyone has settled in on anything yet, but <clears throat> trauma will be discussed a good bit this year. It's just, it's unfortunate that it's being highlighted in this difficult budget climate because sometimes we're having to weigh those two against each other. And when the economy started to take a downturn, the state agencies ended up doing a 6 to 10 percent cut. And when people talk about cuts, they, they quickly go to the agencies looking for what they can do. They've gone, they've been talking about furloughs and continued cuts. How much more can uh, these agencies withstand without losing the services that are being provided? Well, very few of them actually have a 10 percent cut when you take off the pay raises and those other the uh, health insurance rebates that they're getting. So they're really not being cut 10 percent. It's more like 8% on average. Um, as, as Representative Harbin said, we're, we're going to look at every, every part of the budget and, and try to make the best call. The, the trauma funding has to be a top priority. And uh, we did make a down payment on it this year, putting $57 million or so uh, in, in the trauma commission this year. So I think the commitment is there. And, uh, you know, one, one thing, uh, the Chinese symbol for crisis is also the symbol for opportunity. I think mm -hmm. this gives us a great opportunity to really look at government programs and decide if they're valid or not, if they're producing the results we want. And in most cases, we've, we've found that there's a, an awful lot of duplication across state government. So um, it is an opportunity of a sort. You know, one area that's difficult to look at cuts for is, is education, of mm -hmm. course, and of course the largest part of the state budget. <coughs> Where do we look in terms of, of education? Obviously, even talks of furloughing um, non-teaching staff in some cases and other plans. What are we looking at in that regard? As, as with all the budget, I mean, education, we had hoped, we had, we had been able to save it. The governor's original plan had about a 2% cut, I think, wasn't it? Two, whereas everything else was six. Mm -hmm. and now as that's grown, we're going to have to take some cuts in education. I think part of that, though, we will also work to give some relief to local systems so that any state mandates that if we're not going to be funding it fully, maybe give them a little relief, maybe class size instead of right now if you've got 20 pupils in a class and you're at and you've got four classes and you've got 80 students and that 81st child comes in, it used to be that you had to create another class. And maybe we just give a little relief so that you don't have to create that class as quickly so that you hold down the additional mandates that we put on them. I think things like that, because we're going to be cutting again all over education. Uh, the teacher pay raise went out, whereas none of the other employees are getting a pay raise this year. But it had already gone out, it was already in the contracts, and we could not pull it back. So, you know, there, there, were, there were some things we couldn't stop because this happened so quickly. Uh, and we'll have to look at all of education. But the, the, the critical part of cutting education is we have to make sure that we're cutting those things that you can do away with. But because th the money that's getting into that classroom to the teacher, that's got to be the priority. Now, will it be a little less? Probably, but there are areas like you talked about, non-certified places like that, where we could probably take a little more, which will help us get to whatever percentage we're trying to get in education, just like we're doing in a certain percentage in other departments. We're talking about cuts and <coughs> furloughs, and Georgia's situation is actually better than a lot of the states out there. <laughs> if federal money comes in, how does, this, how does this play for Georgia when it comes to the following year? Well, that would be wonderful. <laughs> we, we wish we could depend on Congress, but as we learned a couple of years ago in the Peach Care uh, scenario, we, we waited and waited. Now, I frankly personally believe that, that it's a higher priority this year, and I'm convinced that uh, we'll know something uh, before the session is out. It's a little hard, though, for the House, for mm -hmm. instance, to begin writing a budget based on the hope that we'll receive some funds in a month or so. I, I just, it's going to be difficult to do. So I suspect we'll all head down the road of writing a budget. If we get manna from heaven, then we'll just say thank you and, and go ahead. And, and I think a lot of that, Senator Hill and I, at the end of the budget session, you know, or budget uh, process, there's six of us to come to this conference committee. And I, I believe that that'll be when we actually know whether it's coming or not. It'll be that far along because, as he pointed out, we've, we've got to get a budget moving. We don't want to be here till late April. We would like to get everyone home. This is a difficult year. But in order to do that, we have to keep the process moving, and we can't sit back and wait on the federal government. I, I do hope something happens. Uh, there are areas that we could use the, the, the assistance that I think do help create jobs, but, but we can't sit and wait. That's the problem we're in because you know, with, as he pointed out with Peach Care a few years ago, had we tried to wait, it would have been, what, September? <laughs> I don't think anybody wants the legislature in session in September. <laughs>
Well, Representative Harmon, <laughs> Senator Hill, thank you very much for being with us My today. Thank, oh, you. thank you for having us. A state Senate Appropriations Committee today approved a measure that would require the governor to submit a zero-based budget annually to the General Assembly. Lawmakers Valerie Edwards joins us live with that. Valerie. David, here's how things work now in Georgia, budget-wise. When a new state agency or program is approved and money is allocated, the program is funded into perpetuity. That's called a continuation budget. Under a proposal introduced by Republican Senator David Schaefer of Gwinnett County, a zero-based budgeting system would go into effect in 2011. The bill requires that each year one quarter of the state's 119 departments would be required to submit a zero-based budget to the General Assembly detailing every dollar they want to spend. Given that Georgia currently faces a budget shortfall in excess of $2 billion, Shaver believes now is the right time to make such a move. Right now we spend most of the session arguing over what we should spend extra without ever looking at what was approved years or decades earlier. This bill will require the entire budget to be periodically reviewed by the members of the General Assembly and I think will lead to more efficient and effective government. The bill passed the State Senate Appropriations Committee unanimously, but there was one question by Democrat Ed Tarver of Savannah who wanted to know if the proposed zero-based budget act was more of a short-term measure rather than a long-term solution. Here's how Senator Schaefer responded. The, the concern that, that's always been raised in opposition to this idea is that it requires the members of the General Assembly to do too much work. You know, right now, the, you know, the budget document is about this thick when you print it out. That budget document only describes about 3 or 4% of the state spending, the newly proposed programs. And once those newly proposed programs are approved by us, they are automatically and perpetually rolled over into every succeeding budget under a single line item that's called continuations. So I think it, you know, I think it helps us do a better job as, uh, as stewards of the people's money. A similar measure passed both the State House and Senate during the 08 session, but failed in the final hours. This time around, however, Schaefer believes the proposal has the momentum to make it. If approved, Georgia could see zero-based budgeting along with a new governor in 2011. Reporting live, I'm Valerie Edwards for Lawmakers. Thanks so much, Valerie. In other news, over 60 percent of the state's budget every year goes to education. During last week's budget briefing, state school superintendent Kathy Cox discussed the $197 million reduction in quality basic education funding and how the money is being cut and shifted. Overall, at the end of all the additions, there still is an overall subtraction to QBE a $197 million reduction to the bottom line of QBE. That accounts for that continued enrollment growth, dual enrollment coming over, and the additions and things that have been transferred out of separate programs into QBE to flow directly to the systems to give them discretion over how they spend that money. So the four major areas that have been moved into the QBE program to give local systems discretion are the money for the Educational Technology Training Centers, that's what that acronym is, ETTC, the RESAs, which are our regional education service agencies, the very large commitment that the state has made to putting graduation coaches in our middle and high schools is now in this proposed budget being moved over into QBE and also those classroom cards for teacher supplies at the tune of $11.47 million. So in summary, Superintendent Cox proposed that the QBE cuts to be about 3 percent and state office cuts around 12 percent, adding that the most important work in the state is being done at the local level. Department of Transportation Commissioner Gina Evans describes Georgia's current situation as a brewing of the perfect storm. She mentioned in last week's budget briefings that measures like a transportation special local option sales tax could help balance a $456 million deficit in the long run, but they are also hoping for a federal economic stimulus package ranging up to $1.4 billion. Every single day the requirements are changing. 
and until we finally get a bill, I don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, there is a lot of push and pull going on between the Obama administration and the congressional folks about what this package is really going to look like. As of yesterday, um, day before yesterday, we thought we were going to get about $1.09 billion in federal funds for highways, uh, for roadway program. Yesterday, that number dropped a little bit to about $1.04 billion. Um, and let me just say this, that, that economic stimulus money does not fix my statutory deficit in motor fuel. So I still have a problem in motor fuel regardless of how much money I get on the federal side. So I can't fix I can't fix this problem with LARP state aid personal service debt service and our match out of this federal dollars. I've already tried that in 2008. Now Commissioner Evans adds that quote her clock has been clean when it comes to budget cuts and that even with a massive economic stimulus package much more work will be needed. Savannah Representative Ron Stevens today commemorated the anniversary of the Dixie Crystal Sugar Plant explosion with a call for trauma care funding. He began with a short film about the medical teams that managed the disaster. When I first arrived, there were probably 25 or 30 uh, gurneys out under the Amlets uh, Bay. There were probably eight or nine ambulances that had backed in that were unloading uh, ambulances. Uh, Patients, uh, most of the ones I saw were clearly severely burned. Sometimes you need to put a face whenever we're trying to decide where we're going to spend our money, even in tough times. But I want to introduce somebody in the gallery, real hero in this accident. And this could have been in Augusta and Macon, Atlanta, Columbus, anywhere in our state. Uh, Dr. Fred Mullins from Augusta is with the Burn Center there. I just wanted you to see somebody that really treats people. I hope you'll honor him. And ladies and gentlemen, I got the best for last. Um, a year ago today, or very close to this time, we had a, an incident in Savannah, and uh, it, it's a real testament of what trauma centers can do, and we all want to pray that we got one close to us. I have with us today Mr. Lawrence Manker, Jr., from, uh, down, was down in Savannah, who's now been for a year recuperating. And ladies and gentlemen, in six months, he was in that explosion, He's going back to school. Ladies and gentlemen, would you help me honor Mr. Lawrence Maker and his family? On February 7, 2008, an explosion at the Dixie Crystal plant outside Savannah killed 13 workers and injured over 100. The Imperial Sugar Company was fined $8.7 million by the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration for 120 safety violations. The victims and survivors of the explosion were also honored in the Senate. Senator Seth Harp took the well this morning to introduce legislation that puts restrictions on how attorneys advertise their services. Harp, an attorney himself, explains Senate Bill 41. Look carefully at this. This is modeled after what Louisiana has done. In Louisiana, it was their Supreme Court, I'm told, who, uh, in rulemaking authority, and under Governor Jindal and others, has sought to regulate this pariah on my profession and on our community and our state. And the bottom line is, is I'm asking to do this. Now, I was told by one of the individuals that, well, we'll have, well, this will cause litigation in the courts. And my thought is, is the only way you refine something as is the faulty interpretation of the advertising that the Supreme Court did a number, about 20 years ago is to challenge the provisions in saying that we can regulate ourselves. Now, I don't want to meddle in other people's business, but frankly, until we clean up our own house, sooner or later, somebody else is gonna mind our business if we don't. I would urge you to help me and support me in this process and make Senate Bill 41 come out of the Senate and we can send it over to the House and we can set in process the process of making clarity that lawyers that advertise have to have ethics and have to practice, have to be the lawyer that they say they are and practice. Whenever the Hope Scholarship is threatened financially, several leaders seem to get involved. University System of Georgia Tr Chancellor Errol Davis answered a question last week from Representative Ron Stevens about how soon the lottery-funded Hope Scholarship expenditures will surpass the revenue available. Have you got any thoughts about where we're going as far as cutting the um, Hope Scholarships once we pass this revenue stream? 
or if you got any ideas how we might get some more money? Uh, well, I, uh, I don't know how you're going to get more money out of the lottery. It is certainly one of the best run and most successful uh, in the nation, and we're certainly appreciative of the support that it provides uh, for our students. Uh, this is an issue that will be solved, uh, addressed over multiple years. Uh, there are certain, as you are aware, triggers uh, in the law to ratchet down uh, the amount of the stipend that is paid that with the first year, of course, uh, for non uh, Pell Grant students, uh, the uh, book grant allowance is cut in half, and then the second year it all goes away, and then uh, the third year half uh, of the fees, and then all of the fees, and then it'll be four to five years before you start really reducing uh, the grant uh, itself, and if the reserves may kick in uh, in their interim. Trey Childress, director of the governor's Office of Planning and Budget, also weighed in on this issue Friday, saying this problem could surface as early as next year. Our latest projections show, and it depends on whether you use an aggressive or a, or a conservative uh, revenue projection from the lottery, but it could be as early as 2010 would be the first, the first year where the lines would cross. Now this issue with HOPE came up a couple years back. However, with the current recession, the estimates of HOPE running out of money under the current funding methods have moved up in the timeline. The Georgia Students Finance Commission, along with Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle, hosted the College Yes We Can Day at the Capitol today. The objective of this day is to teach students how to plan, apply, and pay for college. Lawmakers Tiana Fernandez has that story. High school students, teachers, and parents listened while several speakers took turns discussing the different options to help them plan for college. Among them was Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle, who offered some words of encouragement. I see a lot of young faces here today, and I know that they're very bright about starting their careers, and uh, we stand ready as a partner here in Georgia to make that become a reality. Georgia Student Finance Commission representatives then set up several stations where students could ask questions and take time to navigate through the website. We have over a million accounts that have been set up on that site so far for students to um, put together their plans for uh, their high school education, to um, search for careers and uh, fill out assessments that help them understand where what careers they might enjoy. Soon-to-be graduates also came to explore financial options. Many already have plans to attend college after graduation. I was thinking about going to UNC and I want to study to become a psychiatrist. I plan to go to maybe Howard University to study um, international relations. I plan to go to Spelman or pre-law. Georgia Student Finance Commission has already assisted over 2.5 million students plan for college and hopes to increase that number after today. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Tiana Fernandez. Well, coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, proposed coal energy plants in early in Washington counties. Lawmakers Brittany Evans talks with opponents and supporters of that plan. And a joint economic development committee is expected to discuss energy sustainability in Georgia. We'll have that story and more tomorrow on Lawmakers at 7. If you've missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, please tune in tomorrow when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. on GPB or 7 a.m. on GPB Knowledge. You can also keep up with all the action under the Gold Dome Daily on your local GPB radio station during Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Georgia Gazette. Coming up next here on GPB Television, Travels to the Edge with Art Wolf. That's coming up next here on GPB. And that is our broadcast for this, the sixth legislative day of the 2009 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm David Zelsky. And I'm in Wandy Lawson. Join us tomorrow for Lawmakers. Good night. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.